Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Investing Sucks. And today we're going to be taking a look back at 2022 and we're going to be reviewing some of the major themes that defined this year. And specifically, we're going to be looking at the TSX and taking a look at the overall performance of this index and looking at what sectors specifically performed best and what individual companies performed best last year, and also looking at what factors performed best. Because I've talked about factor investing a few times in this channel, and I like to show you guys actual data and evidence that kind of supports the hypotheses behind factor investing. So I think doing this will reveal some pretty interesting insights about what took place in the TSX in the past year. Because last year was a very tumultuous one, and I think the TSX is kind of uniquely positioned where it's an interesting case study because we can see that it has a pretty high concentration of energy stocks, which those were companies that specifically performed well last year, as we'll see. And 2022 was basically the polar opposite of 2021, where it seemed like pretty much everything that you could buy in 2021 was going up in value. And 2022 is basically everything that you could buy was going down in value, with few exceptions, as we'll see when we get into this video. So the first thing I had to do was get a whole bunch of data on TSX stocks. And the data that I decided to get would be valuation metrics, profitability metrics, also the return that the company generated last year on a total return basis, which looks at both capital gains and dividends that you would have received. Because I wanted to capture you know, the actual returns that you would have received if you were invested in that company. And for a lot of companies last year, dividends were a huge part of how you got compensated holding those companies. There were quite a few companies where their market caps actually decrease year over year, but because they pay dividends, you still would have had positive returns. So I wanted to make sure uh, dividends were included in that calculation. So what you're looking at here is my website, tickernomics.com, which if you've been around my channel for a while, you'll know all about this website. But if you are new to my channel, this is a website that I created to help retail investors analyze stocks, basically. We've got TSX stocks, uh, NASDAQ, and New York Stock Exchange companies on here. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to check it out. You do have to use this website on a laptop or a desktop. It doesn't really work on the phone as of yet. But you know, if you want to do research on pretty much any company that you're interested in, then we've got uh, lots of tools available to help you do that. But something we also have is scripting, which uh, this does require a little bit of coding knowledge. Um, as you can see here, this is the code that generates this script. And it basically just calculates all these financial metrics and then puts them in a table so that I can export it into Excel and analyze it a bit easier. Um, but I have already created the script and I've made it public for everyone to use. So it's called a TSX 2022 review. Um, I'd recommend if you do want to look at this to run it soon because it is kind of time sensitive where it basically takes data as of one year ago. So as we get further into the year, um, it's going to, you know, kind of be skewed towards data that's happened in 2023 versus data that's happened, you know, just for the past year. Um, but yeah, so this is the script and it's public. So if you want to access it, you just go to public scripts and then you can search it here, uh, TSX 2022 review. And then once you've located the script and you have it selected, you just click save to my scripts here. And then once you go over to my scripts, you'll see it there. This one here, TSX 2022 review, and then you can run it for yourself. So I'll do that now just so you guys can see what it looks like. And then it's going to generate a table and that table can then be exported into Excel. So I've already exported into Excel and kind of analyzed a lot of the data to show you guys, you know, the insights that you clicked on this video for. Um, so here it is and you just go insight tables and then here's the table here and then you can export to Excel here. So I just wanted to make sure I showcase that uh, just so that anyone who wants to access this list knows how to do that. Now, before we get into the granular level of detail of looking at individual companies and individual sectors, let's first review some of the major themes that kind of define 2022. And 2022, as we all know, did not start out great as it was around February where Russia invaded Ukraine. And this sent many shockwaves throughout the market, which benefited some industries, but also hurt some industries, as we're going to see later. So Western countries were forced to respond to this invasion with sanctions against Russian exports. And two very large Russian exports are oil and gas and fertilizer. So this caused the prices of these two commodities to rise significantly in the early part of the year. And the effects towards the later part of the year did kind of taper off as the prices of those went down. As we can see here, uh, this is just the price of crude oil going back five years. And we can see in June of 2022 is when it got extremely high, over $110 a barrel. 
We'll look at the one year view here, but as we can see in the later part of the year, it did come down by a pretty sizable amount and a kind of a similar story with fertilizer prices. So this is a fertilizer price index and this is going back five years. Not really a whole lot of movement except until 2021 where we can see a pretty uh, substantial increase from where it was uh, in 2020 when things were seemingly normal, uh, 73.70 and then it got as high as 254.97. So clearly the sanctions did have an impact on those industries and this did actually benefit some Canadian companies that sell these commodities because quite simply they're just able, able to charge higher prices. Now a company that this is very much exemplified by is a company called uh, Cenovus Energy. So I want to just pull up this company real quick uh, just to kind of show you the impacts. So we can take a look at what uh, their stock price did in the past year and I'll zoom in a bit so you guys can see this a bit better. So this is our stock price chart. We'll go to the one year view and we can see, you know, a pretty substantial increase. And this is also a dividend pair. We can see currently a 1.37% dividend yield down here. So this company is paying dividends, but they still did have pretty significant capital gains throughout this period. You know, I mean, 50, 55% uh, in the past year, just in terms of capital gains. So not even including the dividends, which obviously the dividends are on top of that. And then let's look at some uh, financials, just zoom in about here. And if you look at the income statement, we can see revenue pretty much 3x from 2020 here into 2021. And I'll take a look at uh, the quarterly revenue just so we can really see the impacts of this. So their most recent quarter, they did just under 20, under 19 billion in revenue, which going back, you know, not even a full or about over a full year, 3.5 billion in quarterly revenue there. So clearly this company was well positioned to benefit from this and I'll also look at their free cash flow because you know that is a pretty significant part of what we look at on this channel so this is the trailing 12 months of free cash flow and clearly as we can see once 2020 who 2022 hit this company benefited significantly and in the last 12 months they've generated over six billion dollars in free cash flow which until this year they never even got close to so this is a perfect example of a company, you know, a pretty prominent company on the TSX. I mean, this is not a small company. We can see a $38 billion market cap. So they do make up a sizable portion of the TSX. And they had an extremely strong 2022, despite a lot of companies, you know, not having a very strong 2022. Now, another major theme that defined 2022 was, of course, inflation. So inflation in Canada, as measured by the CPI, so we can see here it peaked in June of 2022 at 8.1% uh, year over year. So June 2021 versus June 2022. But towards the end of the year, it did actually start to taper off and it got to 6.8% in November here. And if we take a look at the this website here, which is from Statistics Canada, and this is the uh, consumer price index uh, broken down by category. So we can actually see what each category, what inflation is for each category. And you can see December data isn't quite there yet. So let's look at uh, November. This is the most recent month that they should have. And we can see down here, November 2021 versus 2022, the inflation year over year by each category. So there's food, which was 10.3%. So pretty high there, but the one we're all interested in really, and food, by the way, that's obviously going to be linked to the fertilizer prices, which we saw uh, previously what the effect of that was. Uh, but the one I'm more interested in is energy. So this was 13.9%. And a big reason why inflation did start to taper off towards the end of the year was because of energy costs. And of course, energy costs are kind of going to influence various other areas, uh, such as transportation, which we can also see was quite high at 8.5% uh, year over year in November. But let's go back to, say, July and see what the impact was there, because then we can kind of get an idea of why inflation started to taper off. So transportation was higher, 14.4%. Food was 9.2% uh, here, so not all that different. But energy, as we can see, 28% year over year back in July. So obviously that's a lot less than what it's been in November. And we can clearly see, you know, uh, crude oil, which obviously doesn't tell the full story with energy. There are other sources of energy, but it is a significant part of it. The fact that it started to decrease later in the year was a big reason why that happened. Okay, so now let's look at some more detailed level data. And the actual data that you get when you export the script that I showed you before into Excel is this here, which has all of this uh, data here. 
Um, but what I did was summarize most of it to actually get you know some of the more relevant insights. But in case you guys want to do your own analysis on it, then uh, just make sure you follow the steps I showed you earlier in the video so that you can access this list for yourself. Uh, but in summary, the total value of these TSX stocks, which by the way, there's 461 companies uh, in this list here. So the total value of all those companies combined as of one year ago, so at the start of 2022, was 2 trillion to 580 billion. And as of uh, a few days ago, so the end of 2022, it was 2 trillion 479 billion. So that is a decrease of just over 100 billion. But that is just looking at market caps, right? And as we know, dividends are a big part of how you got compensated. And the overall total return, uh, looking at it on market cap weights of all those 461 companies was actually positive. It was just under 7%. Now you may be looking at that wondering, well, that can't be right. I mean, I looked at the TSX yesterday and I saw it had a negative return for the year. And you are correct. If I look at this here, which is the S&P TSX composite index, and if we go back one year, we can see it had a negative 8% return. But this index is different from what I'm looking at. This looks at, I believe it's the 250 largest companies in Canada, uh, whereas this list here is basically all the, the companies that are on the TSX, which includes a lot of small cap companies. And as we're going to see when we look at the factor investing uh, statistics specifically, those small cap companies actually had some pretty strong returns. And we can even see that here where the top three best performers of these 461 uh, TSX companies were all energy companies. We have Villero Energy, uh, uh, Pier Day Energy, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, and then Step Energy Services. And the best return was this one, which had a 375% year over year return. But they are these are all small caps, right? They're, these are their market caps as of the end of the year, Valera had a uh, 138 million dollar market cap which is after you know having this strong return here and what was interesting is 17 out of the 20 best performing tsx stocks last year were small cap energy stocks 17 out of 20 and even the 20 or the three others were they weren't energy stocks but they were small cap stocks and 61 out of 68 stocks that are in the energy sector so there's 68 total stocks that are classified as the energy sector that are on the TSX. 61 out of 68 of them had a positive return in 2022, and then seven of them had a negative return. So if you were invested in energy, specifically small cap energy, and you were heavily weighted in that, then you probably had a pretty good 2022. Um, but here are some of the worst performers. The number one worst performer, which decreased 88.32%, and its market cap as of the year end was $168 million, was Hut 8 Mining Corporation, which is a Bitcoin mining uh, company, which obviously a company like that is very much dependent on the price of Bitcoin, which, as we all know, it went down quite a lot in 2022. Uh, another one was this company, Airboss of America Corp which lost 82%. And then interestingly, Aurora Cannabis, a company that I've never specifically covered on this channel, but I've probably mentioned them a few times. Um, they were, you know, one of, back in the cannabis boom a few years ago, these were one of the companies that everyone was looking at, lost just under 82% last year and is now worth 255 million in market cap. So, you know, kind of a mix there. You know, it was interesting to see how dominant just small cap energy was if we look at the best performers. And I can even do this here and go to the actual data. And then this column here is what the return last year was. So I can sort this from largest to smallest. And I'll zoom in on the companies so you guys can actually read what these are. I mean, look at all these companies. So here's number one, Baylor Energy in the top three. Even, you know, number four here, energy, 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 energy. It's just all energy. I mean, you have to go to this company at the 10th best performer last year, uh, Supramex. I haven't heard of this company. Uh, packaging and containers industry, which is part of the consumer and cyclical space. Uh, let's see what their return was. Their return was 125% year over year. So that's obviously very strong. But they are kind of out of the ordinary here. We have this this gold company here, Eris Gold, which did quite well. Um, but other than that, I mean, you go down the list, it's it's pretty much all energy. And we have one outlier here, or here's an outlier in the technology space, uh, Sierra Wireless, 
which had a return of 76.5%. So it's kind of interesting to see that. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a shock because obviously you're going to have these small cap energy companies that are specifically positioned to benefit from the events that transpired in 2022. But next, let's look at the sector by sector performance. So what I did here was I basically just filtered the stocks for each sector and then calculated what the market cap weighted return was for each sector. And I mean, overall, it wasn't too bad. Obviously, energy was the best one that increased 45.81% year over year. Um, and a big reason for that was dividends, obviously, because some of these energy companies, they're not really at this point, they're not really interested in investing back into production to expand production. I mean, perhaps some of them are, but, you know, when it comes to energy, because the regulatory environment around oil and gas is so it's kind of iffy, right? You don't know what laws are going to get enacted. You don't know, depending on what government takes place, what their attitude towards oil and gas will be. So companies are, I'd say, more reluctant to invest in production and would be more willing to just return cash to shareholders. So dividends were a big part of this 45.81%, um, you know, year over year return here. And they make up 16% of uh, the TSX total market cap anyways. And, but the largest, um, the largest one is uh, financial services, which make up 30% of the TSX, which actually declined, not by that much. I mean, 3% isn't terrible, uh, but it still was a decline. And the worst performing one was healthcare, which declined 41% year over year. Uh, I believe real estate didn't do too well either, which declined 18% year over year. This is a lot of uh, REITs, by the way. And I'm assuming a big reason for that is because of the rise in interest rates that happened as a response to inflation, because real estate, especially REITs, they are very dependent on low interest rates and being able to secure low cost financing. Uh, another good industry we can see here, consumer defensive, which increased 15%. Uh, and just, you know, various returns. I mean, the ones that really stand out, obviously technology as well, which if we actually look at um, the technology tab here, we can see, uh, so here's the return down here. Hopefully you guys can see that, but this is basically a sum of all these market cap weighted returns. So here's negative 31.33% and about 70% of this negative return was Shopify. So, I mean, everyone knows Shopify did not have a great year. Their market cap at the beginning of the year, 431 billion market cap at the end of the year, 162 billion. So not a great year for Shopify. Uh, Constellation Software, not really a great year either for them. Uh, but, you know, that's a company that's been producing stellar returns for many, many years. And really not a whole lot of companies that had positive returns. I mean, we can see there are a few here. Uh, these two companies here, Computer Modeling Group and Vesema Networks, they had positive returns. Um, but overall, I mean, pretty much with a few exceptions, a lot of these companies did have uh, negative returns. Now, next I want to look at here is some companies that I thought were interesting, you know, for various reasons. So one was Dollarama, which actually had a positive 26% return, which I thought that was kind of interesting because Dollarama didn't really strike me as a company that for any reason would have had such a strong return last year, but nonetheless, they did. Uh, Canadian Natural Resources, very large Canadian company, they had a positive 58.8% return, and they were actually the largest contributor to the TSX's overall positive performance. So and what I mean by that is when you take into account one, the positive return they had, and two, their market cap, which means they make up a larger percentage of a market cap weighted index. They were the largest contributor to the positive return. And another large contributor was Suncor, which returned just over 50%. Uh, and then a few interesting ones. So one that I've covered on this channel before, RBI, which had positive 23%, and Canadian Pacific Railway, which it was interesting to see the railways both of the railways, but this one more so, both had pretty strong returns. And another one which I thought was interesting and one that kind of has motivated me to perhaps do a video on this company is Fairfax Financial, which increased 35% year over year, which was kind of an outlier for the financial space. So this is a company that I've been meaning to look at for a while because I've heard uh, some people have commented requesting I do a video on this company. And I have been kind of interested in it myself. Um, you guys know I like to cover financial stocks. So I will likely do a video 
on this company in the near future. And then what I also wanted to look at before we get into, you know, the factor investing aspect was how did dividend stocks do? So here is uh, look, just looking at the dividend yield and looking at non-dividend paying stocks versus dividend paying stocks. So non-dividend paying stocks returned on average, by the way. So this isn't market cap weighted anymore. This is just average. So just taking all of the year over year returns of each company and then just dividing them by the number of companies. Um, so the non-dividend payers had an average return of just under half of a, half of a percent, whereas the dividend payers had just under 4%. So dividend investing showing in the past year why it is the superior form of investing, which I've talked about dividend investing before, and I've kind of made the argument that the reason dividend investing tends to perform so well is not just because of the mere fact that these companies happen to pay dividends, but they have other qualities, their businesses have other qualities which enable them to pay dividends, such as robust operating profitability, conservative reinvestment policies, et cetera, which we'll look at that when we look at the factor investing. Uh, so next I wanna look at what impact did leverage have? So for example, companies with a debt to equity ratio above one versus below one. And didn't wasn't really that much telling. I mean, the companies with a bit of a higher debt to equity ratio did half of a percent better, uh, but really, you know, nothing significant here to look at. But what will be significant is when we look at some of these factor investing things. So let's get into that now. There are five factors I wanna look at. I'll go through each one by one. One is the market factor. So this is basically explaining that uh, companies that have a higher beta are likely to have higher returns because you know they're more risky for whatever reason. Investors are exposing themselves to that increased risk, which means they should be compensated through it for higher returns. And what we saw was, you know, at least for last year, this was very true, where companies that had a beta above one had an average return of just under 11% which is very high. Now, really the reason for this is a high concentration of energy stocks that I happen to observe that had betas above one. Um, and keep in mind, this is average returns. So one company that had say a 300% year over year return could make up for plenty of companies that had slightly negative returns, right? Um, but it was interesting to see just how extreme these two opposites were uh, in, in 2022. Now, the other one is robust operating profitability. So supposedly companies that have robust operating profitability should perform better in the long run, right? I think that kind of just makes intuitive sense. So what I looked at was companies that had a five-year average operating margin above 5% versus below 5%. And then what were their average returns in 2022? The companies with uh, operating five-year average operating margin above 5% did a lot better, 2.75% average return versus 1.26. And now conservative reinvestment. So this one, it is a bit um, you know, interesting. Basically what this looks at is companies that um, have more aggressive reinvestment policies, which they measure by looking at the growth of book value, uh, tend to perform worse than companies with more conservative reinvestment policies. And what we saw was this was actually true in 2022, where we can see uh, the five-year book value growth that was under 10%, 8.74% average return, which was 268 companies. And then companies that had a five-year book value growth rate above 10%, and this is 10% per year, by the way, uh, had a negative return. So clearly in this past year, Companies that were investing in their the growth of their assets more aggressively did a lot worse than companies that weren't doing that. Uh, and then again, this is average return. The results could be different if you look at a market cap weighted return, but I wanted to look at average return because I didn't want to have a scenario where you know you have the larger companies basically just dominating all the results of this. I wanted to make sure that some of the smaller cap companies were getting some love too. So the last two factors that I wanna look at here are one, the value factor, and two, the size factor. So with the value factor, what this proposes is that companies that have a higher price to book ratio will likely perform worse than companies that have a lower price to book ratio, which lower price to book ratio would usually mean value stocks and higher would mean growth stocks. But what we saw in this past year was that this was, wasn't entirely true, 
Um, if we look at companies here that had a price to book ratio above one, they had on average a positive 9.43% return, which was 292 companies. So that is pretty significant in a year that most people considered a bad year. And companies that had a price to book ratio below one, so the value of their equity is higher than the company's market cap, they had a negative 9.90% return, which was 169 companies. But this does change quite a bit if we increase the threshold of the price to book ratio, we increase it to a ratio below two, then the, the return turns positive. The average return turns to 2.17%. So it really just depends on uh, what threshold you're using there, but at least at the surface, it didn't really seem like the value factor was entirely true. Um, but maybe that could change if you looked at it on a market cap weighted basis or um, if you were more specific with where you picked your uh, price to book ratio. Now, an interesting one is the size factor. So this proposes that smaller companies tend to outperform larger companies. And this was definitely true. As we can see, if we look at company companies that had a market cap at the end of 2021 or the start of 2022, so at the beginning of last year, if their market cap was below 1 billion USD, they had an average return of 8.2% versus companies that had market caps above 1 billion USD had a negative 2.64%, which was 249 companies. So the value factor last year was absolutely true and you know pretty significant in my opinion. So anyways, guys, that pretty much does it for this video. I hope you did find this insightful and you learned something. Again, if you want to get this list for yourself, just go to my website, which I'll link in the description and follow the steps I mentioned earlier in the video so you can download this, uh, export it into Excel, and you can look at you know whatever statistics you wanna look at. There's plenty of other uh, columns of data here that I didn't specifically mention, uh, such as the current operating margin um, and you know various other things. I did look at most of these actually. Um, but obviously the one you're going to want to pay attention to is this one here, uh, which is last year's return, which again, I calculated on a total return basis. So capital gains plus dividends received and all figures are in uh, USD. So even though these are Canadian stocks, these are uh, USD figures. But yeah, that pretty much does it for this video. So thank you so much for sticking around and I'll see you guys in the next video.